Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Welcome, listeners, to Fortress on a Hill. We have a, a really great episode for you today. We are here to talk with uh, Hedrick Smith, um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and let his let his uh, let his bio speak for itself. Um, Hedrick Smith, a Pulitzer Prize-winning former New York Times reporter and editor, and Evie Award-winning producer slash correspondent, has established himself over the past 50 years as one of America's premier journalists. His newest work is The De uh, Democracy Rebellion, a one-hour PBS documentary showing how grassroots citizen movements are winning victories for political reform state by state. For the past four years, Smith has cr uh, uh, crisscrossed America, reporting on grassroots movements in more than 20 states and doing on-location filming that captures people power clashing with power brokers and the political establishment in half a dozen states and scoring surprising victories. His website, reclaimtheamericandream.org, has become a go-to informational venue for more than 300,000 viewers interested in reporting and analysis of political and economic reform issues. Smith's newest documentary film is an outgrowth of his most recent best-selling book, Who Stole the American Dream? A stunning account of how we have become two Americas and fallen into a dysfunctional political system. It has been hailed by reviewers both for its compelling stories and brilliant analysis. Uh, from the enthusiastic public response to that book, Smith created his widely used informational website written with the fact check fact checked care and insight of a time-tested journalist. Before moving into book writing and television documentaries, Smith spent 26 years as a reporter, editor, and bureau chief at the New York Times, serving in Saigon, Cairo, Paris, the American South, and as bureau chief in Moscow and Washington. In 1971, he was a member of the Pulitzer Prize winning team for the Pentagon Papers series. And in 1974, he won the Pulitzer Prize for international reporting from Russia and Eastern Europe. His subsequent book, The Russians, was a number one American bestseller translated into 16 languages. Smith's next book, The Power Game, How Washington Works, was filmed by... Um, uh, CPA SN or uh, C SPAN on uh, President Clinton's bedside table. Many members of Congress have used it as a political Bible. His uh, three other best uh, books have also become bestsellers. Uh, for PBS, Hedrick Smith has created 26 primetime specials and miniseries since 1989 on such varied topics as, quote, Inside the Terror Network, uh, Is Walmart Good for America? The Wall Street Fix, Inside Gorbachev's USSR, Can You Afford to Retire, and Rediscovering Dave Brubeck. He's won most of television's top awards, including two Emmys, two National Public Service Awards from Sigma Delta Chi, and two DuPont Columbia Gold Batons for the best public affairs programs on U.S. television in 1991 and 2002. So, um... Hedrick Smith, welcome to Fortress on the Hill. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to be with you guys. I really appreciate it. You know, sir, we are, um, you know, we're thrilled to have you on the pod. I mean, particularly now with the the anniversary of the Pentagon Papers that's coming up. But you know, just hearing the, the bio, you know, you're hardly a, a one-trick pony. I mean, you've worked on domestic and international issues across, like, the range of the globe, 
And we could probably do an episode on almost any subject and you'd be a worthy guest. So we're talking a lot about the Pentagon Papers today and sort of how they're relevant to now and how the, you know, how the times have changed. But it's, it's clear you have an exceedingly and impressively diverse roster. However, this is, you know, we're coming up on the, the 50th anniversary and, and you and I are actually both on panels at the uh, UMass event coming up in May, you know, honoring the work of Dan Ellsberg. So there is a timely kind of anniversary element to this. But what, what's been striking me recently, and I, I mentioned it before we started, is, uh, and, I, and I've mentioned this before in interviews and such, uh, a, a waitress at my local restaurant, like my go-to spot, was telling me the other day that, you know, she studies international relations and political science, and she's super smart and interested in these subjects. But she said, I can't understand why we invaded Iraq or what that was all about. And I was thinking, geez, like that's the event that defined my life. And it wasn't that long ago, but it kind of was. I mean, it was 17 years ago. But here we are coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers. And I was, you know, imagining that you must have that feeling to a certain extent of this was so pivotal earlier in your life. And I think a lot of our listeners who are younger, especially maybe Vietnam doesn't resonate quite as much, maybe the social turmoil. So if you don't mind, I was hoping you could potentially give us just kind of some context and backstory to that period, you know, the, the late 60s, the early 70s, what America was like at home and, and its policy abroad, and just like the general tenor that was going on when this breaks, right? When the Pentagon Papers kind of enters your life and, and of course, probably has a profound effect. You know, Danny, it's a wonderfully interesting introduction you've just given, not to me, but to the subject, because all of us as young people, and you're talking about your young life in 2003, getting involved in Iraq, and I'm talking about 1963, 60 years, 40 years before that, and my young life getting into Vietnam, and we're talking about young people today. What's common there in that theme is young people coming of age in the midst of a crisis or the midst of a war, trying to figure out how the world is What's going on? Why are the people in power doing what they are doing? What does it mean to me? Um, in Vietnam, people were burning their draft cards. The young American guys uh, were going to Canada to avoid the draft. Uh, the country was a boil. Uh, kids at Kent State were shot by the National Guard. Uh, there were demonstrations all over the country. Uh, as a reporter who's worked in Washington off and on since the early 1960s, um, 1967, 1968, the heart of the Vietnam period, was one of the most acid political years uh, that I'd ever seen until uh, the Trump period. And then we have it again. And, 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 and uh, it, it keeps coming back. Knows it doesn't really matter exactly that Vietnam was 50 years ago or Iraq was 17 years ago. What matters is what the people in power are doing, what decisions they're making, which are having an impact on the lives of millions of people. Parents couldn't talk to their kids back in the 1960s. Um, Dean Rusk, who was the Secretary of State, and Bill Fulbright, who was the Democratic Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, had gone to Oxford University together. They couldn't talk to each other. They were on the opposite sides of the Vietnam War debate, and they had gotten so hostile that they were old friends and they couldn't even talk to each other. So, I mean, flash forward, you know, to the 2020 election, and you had people in the same family who could hardly talk politics to each other. So these things resonate from one period to another. And what was going on in America was, was a tremendous upheaval. That's the first thing. The second thing that was going on was a sense in the media, and as a reporter and a young reporter, that was terribly important to me, of course, is we were starting not to believe our government. Now, that's old fashioned now. That's everybody feels that way now. But that wasn't the case in the early 60s. If the government told you in the early 60s, the economy was going pretty well. Uh, unemployment was such and such a number. Uh, the election was OK. The ballots were counted. You didn't have half the country or a third of the country or a quarter of the country or even 10 percent of the country saying, we don't believe you. You didn't have people turning around saying, we're not going to get a vaccine. We're not going to wear a mask because it's either Republican or Democrat. That wasn't going on. People disagreed. They disagreed about the issues, but there weren't these automatic flashpoints. Vietnam became one of those automatic flashpoints. 
where the country just split into, uh, where parents, as I said before, couldn't talk to children, where people were fleeing uh, because of the, the Vietnam War, fleeing the draft, fleeing the country. Um, uh, universities were afire. They were getting shut down. Uh, college campuses were being occupied by students, whether it was California or Massachusetts Institution of Technology or where you guys are on the West Coast or down South. I mean, the, the, it, it's almost impossible to imagine the country more on fire. As a matter of fact, when I was thinking about it, uh, in the Trump period uh, coming up to the election of 2020, I thought, what does this remind me of? And my first thought was 1968. 68 is the year that Martin Luther King is shot. It's the year that Bobby Kennedy is shot. It's the year of the a, a police riot at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. That's what's telling you what's going on. War had absolutely uh, brought America to a boiling point. So I, I would say that's the, that, that's the experience that people of your generation can relate to, if you want to call yourselves the Iraq generation, the Iraq war generation, and people of the current generation can relate to, and you can call them people of the election of 2020 and the January 6th riot and the occupation of, of the Capitol by uh, the Proud Boys and the, uh, and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and the other people who were there. We're once again a country that's been a boil. And the question now, uh, we're not on this subject today, is whether or not things are going to calm down and we're going to at least get back to ordinary policy uh, arguments and, and, uh, and conflicts or whether or not we're going to stay uh, critically divided. But Vietnam was one of those times when there was an earthquake and there was a fault line, just like the St. Andreas Fault a fault line that runs through Southern California. And you literally could see a quake and you can see a division uh, in the surface of the country, in the country politics. So that's what the country was like. Um, and there was just enormous, enormous disillusionment with the war in Vietnam, with the sense that America had gotten caught in a quagmire. That was what David Halberstam, a correspondent for the New York Times, called it the making of a quagmire. We were stuck in the mud and we couldn't get ourselves out of it. We didn't quite know why we'd gotten into it. Um, we sure as heck didn't know where we were going. Uh, and it was a mess and we couldn't figure out how to get out of it. And what's fascinating about the Pentagon Papers is it was Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, appointed by John F. Kennedy, carried on by Lyndon Johnson, who ordered the Pentagon Papers to be written because he, one of the principal architects of the Vietnam War policy, had lost faith, had become disillusioned, thought it was a terrible mistake, and he wanted to understand how it happened, and he wanted the Pentagon internally to gather together the records from the Eisenhower administration and the Kennedy administration and the uh, uh, Johnson administration over a period of 20 years so that there would be collected a record of what the hell went wrong. That's what the Pentagon Papers were. And that's why they were dynamite, because it wasn't just a bunch of miscellaneous intelligence documents uh, that got dumped out. And it really does differ from WikiLeaks and it does differ from the Afghan papers because it wasn't down at the field level. This was, these were the crown jewels. This was at the top of the mountain. This was the president communicating with the U.S. ambassador in Vietnam. This was the head of MACV, the Military Assistance Command, our commanding general in Vietnam, communicating with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It was the CIA guys connecting with each other. It was the State Department people at both ends. This was at the apex of the American government. And McNamara had ordered the collection of all these top secret eyes only documents. So the Pentagon and the government at least would have a record of what went wrong, how we got so screwed up, how we had created the quagmire that was sinking us. That's what the Pentagon Papers were. And they came plop into this nation that was already a boil. And it had, I mean, it had tremendous impact as a result. Well, you know, what you're describing is, is so fascinating to me because I think that Right now, a lot of folks do have the sense, as you sort of mentioned, that they're living through, especially young people, living through another pivotal fault line moment. And that, that may well be true. 
uh, or, or it may not, right? It, it sort of depends and the historians will judge, although I think every generation has its pivots. But I do think a lot of people forget the tumultuousness of the 1960s. You know, I'm a, I taught history at West Point, so I like to think I'm just a little bit more in tune. But the reality is, I, I imagine if you didn't live it, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine. This morning, I mean, you, you almost can't make it up. I, I finished reading Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five for, I don't know, the 12th time. Just happened to time out. And at the end of the book, you know, it was kind of written around that time. He says at the end of the book, he, he comes back into the first person and he says, uh, two days ago, uh, Robert F. Kennedy was killed. You know, so it goes. Two months before that, Martin Luther King was killed. So it goes, you know, in his Vonnegut style. And it's striking because, you know, he's showing you the, 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 the wildness of that era and the sense of, of turmoil. And then I think about my own father, who didn't serve in Vietnam and was actually opposed to that war. And you talked about going to Canada uh, but didn't end up happening. You know, they, they went to the lottery system at that point. But it, it rem and then he turned Reagan Democrat, sort of Reagan Republican, and now he's very conservative. My point is, throughout my life, it seemed very clear to me that even not having served in Vietnam, this was like a pivotal thing to him. You know, whether he should have served, whether he made the right decision, uh, how he fell down on the issues was very much informed by that. And I can't help but think that folks may not realize, especially young people, the extent to which they're living in the world that the Vietnam fault lines, the resultant domestic revolution, and in no small part, you know, you contributed to this, this element, which I'm gonna ask about, the changes maybe forever to the media and the press's relationship with the American people. So I guess what I wanna ask is really twofold. You kind of mentioned what's in the Pentagon Papers, right? A bit, why, what was so interesting about their genesis. Uh, what I'm interested in is, you know, why the material inside of it mattered so much in terms of what it actually looked like. You know, people hear Pentagon Papers and maybe they imagine an actual stack of papers and to the extent that's what we're talking about. But, you know, what sort of stuff was in it that was so pivotal to get out? And most importantly, I think from your perspective, what you can offer, how did most or different ranges of the press at the time sort of respond to the release, right, to sort of the leak? How did it alter the press and how was it responded to in that moment? Well, you need to understand, first of all, that that the reporters in Vietnam, Neo Sheehan, David Halber, Sam, Malcolm Brown of Associated Press, Peter Arnett, others, had been writing critically about the war from the war zone and lots of others as well from the early 60s onward. The uh, claims that the American military was making uh, were of victories and they were reporting kill counts against the Viet Cong and how we lost few and they lost a lot or the same thing was true, the South Vietnamese army. And there'd been a lot of skepticism about that by the reporters on the scene. And then, I mean, I'd been exposed to that. I'd been in Vietnam in 63, 64 myself, along with Neil Sheehan. And then back in Washington, where I reported on it, and Sheehan did as well, and so did lots of others. There was skepticism about what the government was saying uh, about, uh, there was at that point, bombing of North Vietnam going on. And they were saying they were hitting military targets and they were targets and they were trying to stop munitions and men and manpower from flowing from North Vietnam down to South Vietnam, down to what they call the Ho Chi Minh Trail through, Viet, uh, Viet, uh, through Laos and into Vietnam. South Vietnam. And so there was argument constantly going on about what was sort of true and what was exaggerated and what was being left out. And what was stunning, and I'd written stories enough, I didn't even know it at the time, okay? I had written stories that were enough that, that Richard Nixon and Herbert Hoover and, and Henry Kissinger had my phone wiretap, okay? So I'd written stuff that was critical. So it wasn't as if I didn't know something was wrong. And, and I, I wasn't unique. They tapped four other guys and they tapped 17 people inside the administration. So, so there was critical stuff going on. But when I walked into that room with Neil Sheehan and we worked together for three months in a New York hotel room because we were hiding from the FBI to make sure they didn't catch up with us. There were 7,000 pages of top secret eyes only. Eyes only was a higher classification. What it meant was only a limited audience. You didn't just have to have a top secret clearance, but you had to have your name on that document or a reason to see that document. So if there was an eyes only from the president to the ambassador, maybe the president and four or five of his aides could see it. But other people in the White House who had top secret doc, uh, clearances, they couldn't see it. People in the Pentagon couldn't see it. So these were extremely limited documents. 
And when we sat down and we started read through, we found evidence day after day after day that the government had been knowingly lying to us, that the stories that we wrote that were critical about the government and questioned the government's version of things were nowhere near skeptical enough, that they knew what they were doing. When they said they were bombing in North Vietnam and they were bombing three or four kilometers, clicks, they used to call it clicks from the center, uh, from the city. It turned out they meant three or four clicks from the center of the city. So they might, and the city might extend out 10 miles. So they were actually bombing in populated areas and they knew it, but they told us they weren't. So, so when you see that and you see it again and again and again, it has a powerful impact on you. Uh, we had backed, our administration had backed a Catholic regime of people who fled from North Vietnam or Catholics who were running South Vietnam. There was the No family. No Din Ziem was the president. No Din Nu was his brother, who was head of the secret police. They had finally become so unpopular because they were losing the war. Uh, they were repressing Buddhists. Buddhist monks were setting themselves on fire in protest. They were committing suicide to protest against this Catholic regime. And eventually the regime was overthrown by a bunch of Vietnamese generals. And we suspected and we suggested that the Kennedy administration and the president himself had given those orders to go ahead to the Vietnamese military to overthrow it. But they had denied it. And when we opened up the top secret paper, there was the evidence that, in fact, yes, they had given those orders. OK, so the United States was deeply involved in getting rid of its own chosen um, boss, out in, in Vietnam, which they had denied. Uh, there was a point at which after um, there was a huge uprising, it was called the Tet Offensive, Tet being the, the lunar holiday out in Asia, an early war, which the Asians all celebrate. And they had a huge Vietnamese offensive. And after that offensive, um, uh, William Westmoreland, the four-star general who was commanding American troops out there, asked for 206,000 more American troops. There were already 525,000, and they weren't winning the war. He wanted 206,000 more troops. Sheehan and I had written a, a bombshell story about that. It caused all kinds of trouble. We can go back and talk about that if you want. But, uh, but the administration denied it. And they said, well, no, he hadn't asked for that. Well, we found out when we got into the documents, the game was the White House did not consider it a request for troops, a, quote, formal request for troops, in quotes, until the president approved it. It was uh, an informal memo. It was a proposal. It was something else. So, so they said they were denying, and it was a verbal trick they were playing. And we looked at the documents, and we saw, absolutely, that's exactly what happened. But they had denied it. And when they got involved in, in, in all kinds of fighting, where it was going badly in places like Kisan and other places in, in, in Vietnam, they had given a totally varnished picture of what was going on. When we looked at the documents and they showed exactly the losses that we were suffering and the South Vietnamese were suffering. Once again, they lied. And even, even going back to the Eisenhower administration, they had lied about the way they had set up uh, the, the No Din Diem government. Uh, there was a third way. There was another way they could have gone, non-communist, uh, but not anti-communist. They, they could have negotiated with. They denied that that was the case. And when we looked at the documents, there it was. So that what happened was, at least to us, was that one day after another, and remember, we did this for 90 days, for three months. We were working our way through this thing. And we put out, uh, the New York Times published so much, so many documents. We published the actual documents. So there was an argument within the New York Times whether or not the publisher would go to jail for taking classified stolen information or whether or not we as reporters would go to jail for having aided and abetted the enemy by publishing uh, secret documents during wartime. So those are the kind of risks that were going on. It, it, was like, it was like being hit by artillery fire to see all these lies exploding in our laps and then to tell that story. And you ask how the rest of the press responded. It was amazing. It was utterly amazing. Because what happened was as soon as the New York Times published the Pentagon Papers, it went on for three days and the Nixon administration went into court to stop the publication, saying it was endangering national security. 
Now, remember, these were all historical documents. We published them in 1971, and the Pentagon Papers' history stopped in 1968. We were always very careful never to report anything in advance about a live military operation. We never wanted to be endanger our own troops or endanger the military order of battle. But this stuff was minimum three years old, okay? So there was no way it could endanger the current military situation. We didn't even use the diplomatic annex of the Pentagon Papers because we didn't know whether or not the diplomacy trying to seek peace and a peaceful settlement was still going on. So we respected the security on the diplomatic stuff. We were very careful to make sure we were not, in fact, endangering national security. We didn't just publish everything that came into our hands. Okay, But the Nixon administration said it was. And so they went to court and the court shut us down. We got three days of the Pentagon Papers initially published. We went to court and finally went to the Supreme Court uh, and eventually got resolved. And we were allowed to go on and resume the publication. But in between the time that we got shut off and we got it turned back on, Ellsberg went and his buddies went to the Washington Post and they picked up and they started to print the Pentagon Papers. And the government went off and shut down the Washington Post. And then he went to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and he shut down the Post-Dispatch and went to the Boston Globe. It went on around the country. The point was the media in America got the message. Neil's attitude and my attitude was the American people had paid for these documents. This was the official history of the war compiled by the Pentagon at the orders of the Defense Secretary, Robert McNamara. And the taxpayers had paid billions of dollars, and we lost 56,000 lives. So with blood and treasure and lots of wounded as well, we had paid for those. And the public was entitled to it. The only people who didn't know the Pentagon Papers was the American public. The Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, they knew the score. But the Congress and the public didn't know it. People inside the administration knew it. So our attitude was the public had a right to know. And that attitude really revolutionized American journalism, and it's lasted until this day. I mean, it's had a tremendous impact because it was picked up, as I said, by all these other papers. But it wasn't just that the story was picked up. It was the attitude was picked up. The mindset was picked up. This was not classified information that the government could sit on because it was embarrassed, politically embarrassed at the mistakes that, it, that people had made. It was politically embarrassed by uh, the losses that had been suffered. It was politically embarrassed to admit uh, that his hand was in this episode or that episode, some of which I've discovered, described, but there are plenty more. That's not an adequate reason. National security is an adequate reason, but political embarrassment is not. And I think that was that was a watershed uh, when that happened. Uh, you got the Pentagon Papers, and after that, very soon after that, you had the Watergate and the Nixon scandal, which was another scandal. But the Pentagon Papers had a tremendous impact on the Washington Post and other reporting on Watergate, and then subsequent reporting uh, after that. The whole attitude towards um, what's behind it, what's known, who knew what, when, has been, it was always there, but it became acute. Uh, and I, I think it's changed uh, the ethics, it's changed the attitude of the media ever since. Uh, some people would say it's damaged it, that there's so much mistrust uh, that when, sometimes when the government is doing something reasonably well and it's making honest mistakes, uh, there's too much mistrust. And there may be something to that. But I'm prepared to err on the side of, of uh, being more skeptical uh, than, than being less skeptical. I think that's, that's how you hold power accountable. And that, that was the attitude, I think, going all the way through. So it had, um, you know, that I mentioned the story about the 206,000 troops that were requested. Sheehan and I wrote that story. It wasn't the Pentagon Papers, but it was leading in that direction. After that story ran, uh, Lyndon Johnson lost the New Hampshire primary uh, in the 1968 run up to the 1968 election. And within a month, he decided not to run for re-election as president of the United States. So there was a real impact of these stories on uh, uh, the history of the time. Uh, unfortunately, um, 
the Pentagon Papers and the publication of the Pentagon Papers did not lead to a quick early peace in Vietnam, which I'm sure was Dan Ellsberg's point at leaking them. Um, it, it still took another several years. We ran them in 71. And you don't really get to a peace deal until 75. Uh, you don't see the Americans pulling out of there. So it's another three or four years. But it did have a tremendous impact on the, uh, the way the press operates, the attitude of mind of the press. Uh, and the political environment, the political climate in the United States. Our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters, helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes but you don't have to contribute ten dollars a month to help us for as little as a dollar a month you can help keep us going paying for hosting and storage fees transcribing all the new episodes promoting and expanding the podcast and more i'm sure i can't think of at the moment so let's bring out our honorary producers and they are will arends fahim shirazi james obar adam bellows eric phillips Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Zach H., Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Why I Am Anti-War Podcast, Kenneth Cordasco, Corgoth, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our awesome store on Spreadshirt.com for some great Fortress merch. The link is in the show notes. And now, let's get back to the podcast. You know, so much of what you described there transitions so well into comparisons and, and contrast and analogies with, with the present, which, you know, one always must be careful about, right? The history doesn't repeat itself. Or there's not direct lessons, but there are certain inflections and uh, comparisons that can be drawn. One of the things that you mentioned that jumped out at me before I handed over to Henry for kind of our transition into the Afghan papers and current free press issues is this idea that, you know, it didn't stop the war, right? I mean, it's very, it's rarely that black and white. You know, the Pentagon Papers didn't necessarily stop the war. The Tet Offensive before that didn't necessarily stop the war. But it certainly it seems to have had an enormous effect. But I often hear someone like Car- Colonel Larry Wilkerson, uh, who, you know, who I work with, who used to be Colin Powell's chief of yeah. staff, as well as his really whole generation, talk about the Vietnam Syndrome you know, after the Vietnam War and the, the American people and even politicians not wanting to get involved in another Vietnam. And, and this really continues to resonate during Reagan's forays into Central America. And it strikes me that, you know, a lot of that does seem to be tied not just to the military lessons of Vietnam, such as they were learned, but to the skepticism you're describing in uh, about the press uh, or the press's antagonism or trusting the government and people doing the same, which strikes me as a social component as much as a purely political and military one. So and just all the different elements of the way the press handled it is is so fascinating. And with that, Henry, I I, I want to you know have you kind of transition into you know the the modern applications of this because I just know uh, that Hedrick has so much to offer there, just from what he said about the past. Right, we're still fifty years ago, and yet I mean I heard a thousand different uh, connections. And so uh, yeah, please jump in with that. Well, in, in keeping what you mentioned, Danny, about, about Vietnam syndrome and about the, the greater idea of disloyalty here, um, in studying some of the differences between the Pentagon Papers and the Afghanistan Papers, there was one similarity that showed up that it really concerned me, and, and it, it goes to what you were talking about, that both sets of papers seem to have their own loyalty issues. <clears throat> You know, with the Pentagon Papers only being drawn from existing reports, uh, 
in an effort to avoid getting noticed by by the military brass or other civilian leaders and then we move to to now to the to the afghanistan papers where um uh, a friend of the podcast and uh state department whistleblower matthew ho who is uh he talked about this recently on a podcast i listened to and mentioned that only f- there were only 40 out of 400 names of those who gave testimony as part of the Afghanistan papers that were actually named entirely unredacted. Um, and those who were publicly named um, did their best to to kind of head it off by saying that they were misquoted. And at worst, uh, that someone someone would say that they that these are flat out lies that this person didn't say that at all, and it, it goes to you know the the especially in the military but in the national security state in general that criticism equals disloyalty and disloyalty becomes a betrayal of some kind. Um, Hedrick, what did what did you observe during that time? working on the Pentagon Papers in terms of being told or thought of as disloyal in one way or another? And how did you and your colleagues handle those misconceptions? Um, Well, the law firm that the New York Times had used for decades, uh, Jesus, I'm forgetting the name right at this minute, told the publisher of the New York Times that this would be treason, and they refused to defend the New York Times uh, uh, in court if the publisher decided to go ahead with a publication. Uh, Lord and Day was the name of the firm. They walked out. Okay, so, I mean, you talk about whether or not it was an issue. Harding Bancroft, who is the executive vice president, the number two person under the publisher of the New York Times, told the publisher that he shouldn't do this. Okay. Uh, that this was betrayal, this was aiding the enemy, this was taking stolen documents, this was handling classified information. I can tell you, I spent 26 years with the New York Times. I never, other than the Pentagon Papers, ever took hold of a physical classified document. I never wanted to be accused of, of, of publishing classified information. Now, the government insisted, and they wiretapped my phone, that I had published classified information. But if it was classified, there was no classification that I ever saw. So this was a different kind of risk. This was, And we talked about it. We were all prepared to go to jail. Uh, and we, uh, we hid. Uh, we lived in a hotel room in New York City uh, for three months, she and I, and the name of the on the room was Gerald Gold. It wasn't Hedrick Smith and Neil Sheehan. Gerald Gold was the deputy foreigner of the New York Times. Every time we ordered room service, or every time we got on the phone, every time everything we did, it was always Gerald Gold. We never admitted who we were. So we were hiding. Um, and in the last two weeks uh, before the Pentagon Papers was published, and we had done a lot of the writing, but we hadn't brought it all home, Uh, The New York Times was worried that the FBI would find us, and so they literally moved us into the building of the New York Times, and we lived in the health clinic of the New York Times because they figured the FBI would be less likely to raid the home offices of the New York Times than they would be to come break into our hotel room, uh, you know, on 6th Avenue and the Hilton Hotel and cart us and the documents all away. So the notion that there was a legal risk that people would call us traitors that were aiding the enemy and over was vibrant. I mean, it was there throughout the whole thing. Our belief was what I said to you before. Number one, uh, these were historical documents. There was nothing that exposed national security at the time. Uh, These were published in 1971. These were papers that all, everything cut off in 1968 with the end of the Johnson administration, uh, and and um, maybe that's January 1969, but in terms of history, it was 1968. So there was nothing uh, contemporary that we were jeopardizing. We were uh, breaking um, laws and rules uh, in terms of um, publishing stuff that was classified and the government hadn't declassified it. So I suppose in terms of those technical breaking those rules, that was probably true. But in terms of, of national security, we thought we were we were aiding national security. Why? We need to go to the heart of it. The Constitution deliberately gives the Congress the authority to declare war. And what had been going on in American foreign policy, and it was epitomized by Vietnam, 
And it may have been uh, illustrated once again in, um, in Iraq, less so in Afghanistan, was that the executive, the president, had concluded that we needed to go to war. Why is that a problem? Why does that make a difference? The whole idea that Congress should declare war, that the founding fathers said Congress should declare war, was because the House of Representatives was the closest of any body in the government to the people, having to run for re-election every two years. And the idea was that you shouldn't be able to wage war unless you have your public behind you. And you ought not to be able to lie to your public about what you were doing and still go to war. The notion that what's different between democracies and dictatorships, Putin or Xi Jinping can do whatever he wants. If he wants to send troops into Ukraine, uh, Putin, or if she wants to send troops down into Burma right now, uh, uh, you know, uh, Myanmar, where you've got this coup going on and so forth. He can do it. He doesn't have to consult the Chinese people. But the difference between that and Britain, France, Germany, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, is that we are parliamentary democracies. We're democracies where the power rests with the people. War is the most serious decision any government can make to put the lives of its people deliberately at risk. And it's got to be done in the national interest, and it has to be supported by the people. Look at the difference between the way Americans responded in World War II to the way they responded in the Vietnam War. World War II was the war they saw as threatening American democracy, and they were behind it. People volunteered. They went to war. We had four or five years. We turned over the whole way. We ran industry. Everybody got behind the war effort because they believed in it. It was a declaration of war after Pearl Harbor was attacked and so forth. Not so in Vietnam. Very muddy situation when you had the the Vietnamese patrol boats getting involved with uh, um, an American destroyer off the coast of North Vietnam. And then you had the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. Very muddy as to whether or not that was really a declaration of war. But two American presidents, Johnson and and Kennedy, decided to push ahead. It It was like being out at the end of a limb. And so when we looked at the Pentagon Papers, We said the American public has been led down a path, whether you agree with the war or not, it has not been told the truth about the nature of the war, about the number of troops involved, about the military losses, about the political decisions that have been made. And the public has a right to know that if it's going to be asked to send its sons and daughters and send it money to Washington to fight that war. So what we felt we were doing was we were reconnecting the government to the people. We were reconnecting with the idea of the founding fathers that you can't wage war without the support of we the people, and you can't have that support if you don't level with them and tell the truth. And if the government has put together its own portrait, remember, this was the government's own history of the war. It should be prepared to share that with the people if it's going to say, hey, another three, four years, we got to fight this. You can say that same thing about Afghanistan now. After how many years is it we've been there now? 17 years, something like that. You know, I mean, at some point, there has to be reckoning. And, you know, one of the things that administrations do is they don't raise taxes to finance the war. People need to know the price of war in blood and in treasure, and in the social divisions it costs, if they're going to back the war. And governments need to share that with the people in a democracy, if they're going to wage war in the name of that democracy and in the name of those people. So if we we felt, I don't want to call it a higher patriotism, but we certainly felt we were being true to the democratic faith. We were being to the faith of our democracy. I don't mean to the party, Uh, the party doesn't matter. We were being true to the notion that the government is supposed to represent the people and the government's actions are supposed to represent the will of the people and the government has to level with the people in order to get the popular consent, the consent of the government 
governed is the basic notion of our democracy or our representative democracy or our republic. I know people argue about whether it's a democracy or a republic. A representative democracy and a republic, I believe, are the same thing. But the point was, we felt we were serving the people. This wasn't, this was not meant, and, and let me tell you, one of the most interesting people involved in this was Abe Rosenthal, who was the executive editor of the New York Times at that time. Abe Rosenthal was a war hawk. He was a hawk on the war in Vietnam. He believed in the war. He thought it ought to be fought. He thought we were fighting the communism spreading around the world from Russia to China and then across Asia and down through Vietnam and so forth. But he had absolutely rock solid belief that the public had the right to this information. And then they could make their decision. He could make his decision. We could make our decision. The point was it had to be shared with the public and the public then had to let the Congress and the president know how it felt about the war. So yeah, we faced exactly what you said. We faced those charges and that was our response. I wanted to ask you a little bit about press freedom as it exists in America today. Um, between the, the treatment of Julian Assange, uh, who, who Joe Biden's referred to, or he referred to WikiLeaks to as a high-tech terrorist, and the overall sad state of journalism as it pertains to national security and advocating for those without a voice, which you just, just laid out very eloquently. What do you think our, our listeners should do in order to return to that better tradition of, of journalism, especially regarding uh, national security? Well, I, th I, I may not share exactly your assessment of it uh, that I heard. Um, for example, the Washington Post, um, you know, did a hell of a job exposing the black prisons and the torture that was going on um, during the Iraq war period. Uh, I mean, that, that was certainly challenging in the most fundamental way the policy of the Bush administration. And then it uh, went on into the, by the uh, Obama administration, but it started with the Bush administration. The New York Times did, and actually um, I did a documentary for PBS called Spying on the Home Front, which was about NASA, uh, NSA, tapping uh, the, the wire uh, communications electronic communications of Americans domestically. And the New York Times did a hell of a job exposing that. So, I, and, and there are other examples as well. Uh, I, I, th I think there's been pretty vibrant um, uh, uh, reporting on national security affairs. I, I'm concerned about the press uh, in America and other ways on other issues uh, it, it, more than I am on this issue uh, at the moment. Um, uh, certainly, uh, Assange's case, the WikiLeaks story, uh, uh, the uh, remind me of the name of the private who changed sex. I've forgotten. Uh, uh, Chelsea Manning. Yeah, Chelsea Manning. Yeah. Um, you know, the Chelsea Manning story, those stories have all been covered uh, pretty well. And I mean, there's been a lot of information about the Afghan papers, as you point out. Uh, the Washington Post ran a series. So it's not as if it, it, it got it, not as if it got ignored. Um, so are there shortcomings? Yeah, there's no question. Uh, is the government still trying to protect uh, 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 secrets? Uh, is the government still trying to go? I mean, the Obama administration was one of the toughest, uh, which was surprising to me for a, a president who was a constitutional lawyer. I mean, he went after press leaks uh, more vigorously than, than anybody before or after him did, Obama did. I, I was surprised at that. So there's no question uh, the, the instinct in the government is still to uh, withhold lots of, of information. Uh, uh, terribly embarrassed. Uh, about all the Snowden revelations. On the other hand, uh, there were some petty denials, but there weren't really kind of the sweeping denials uh, of the Snowden leaks about NSA and its operations um, that there would have been 50 years before. I mean, I, I, the, the extent, the hold of the, the mindset of the national security state seems to me today to be much less than it was when we confronted it in Vietnam. 
which is not to say it isn't still there. It is there. Um, but I don't think we have the same problems of press independence. And I don't think, um, and I think even in Congress, the intelligence committees, the willingness of the Senate Intelligence Committee over a long period of time to put together its separate report on black prisons, on, on uh, waterboarding and torture uh, by the CIA uh, against terrorism and so forth. Uh, prior to Vietnam, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, subsequent to Vietnam, uh, it happened a bit. I think the fact that that happened tells you that institutional attitudes have changed significantly. Maybe they're not ideal, but I think they're much better uh, today than they were 30, 40 years ago. Well, sir, um, you know, we uh, it, it's, it's funny talking about some of these issues because I think that what becomes obvious is that the, the resonance of the past is complicated. It's not a direct and it's not a linear line. Uh, at the same time, it's real. And, you know, we had talked about originally doing, you know, 30 minutes of discussion on this and it became apparent as well. We, we could probably talk about this for two more hours. I mean, we, there's so much that's profound about the area you're describing, socially, politically, militarily, overseas, and then this press element. Um, but it's clear from your comments that what's old is new sometimes, and that while there are major differences worth pointing out, uh, things like the Assange case, things like Snowden, things like Chelsea Manning, the Afghanistan papers, now the Afghanistan study report, which says the opposite thing of the Afghanistan papers in many cases, right, and is populated by these military industrial complex infused, you know, think tankers and, and insiders. So much of this uh, is nothing new under the sun to a certain extent. I mean, there are differences, but a lot of this has been has been covered and we've seen it before in your era. So uh, in, in a general sense, you know, uh, I, I think we're going to kind of, you know, sort of wrap the conversation here because there's just so much that's been covered. But I was wondering if there were, you know, kind of final thoughts or points that, you know, you would like to make regarding you know, the, the work you did on the Pentagon Papers and that era and what's happening today. You know, if there was were things that you wanted to leave uh, a, a listener who maybe was new to some of this material with, you know, what really stands out for you in a concluding sort of way? Well, let me just pick up with from what you just said. You said, you know, in some ways there's nothing new under the sun. I think that puts the wrong turn on it. The answer is these are continuing vibrant issues in any democracy, in any uh, modern nation state with significant military power and engagement around the world. The issues about how that power is used, who makes the decisions of that power, what kind of leveling and honesty there is to the uh, public, how aggressive and assertive the media is at ferreting out what it can about who is making decisions, how and why, and, and to what extent are our personal liberties concerned? I mean, I mentioned to you earlier that as a reporter for the New York Times in the 1960s, my telephone was wiretapped. I filed a lawsuit. It took me 11 years to get the transcripts of those wiretaps. And when I read them, the only thing I can say to you, it's the closest thing I can think of what it must feel like if you're a woman and you've been raped. I looked at recordings of my kids talking to their friends, my wife talking to her mother about vacations. And this is America the land of the free, the home of the brave. Everybody runs around talking about patriotism and freedom. And the government can come snooping. When we were doing the Pentagon Papers, Neil insisted when I first joined him in there that we always use the name gold, that we follow certain security procedures and so forth. And I said, Neil, I'll do what you say. You're right. We don't want the FBI to find us. But I can't believe our government would wiretap the phones of American reporters doing their job unless they actually thought we were spies. And I was so naive. That was 1971, two years earlier 
the Nixon administration, signed off by Kissinger, J. Edgar Hoover, deputy head of the FBI, and so on down the line, had wiretapped my home phone. These things are precious to us. And part of the difficulty is that in the electronic age, we've gotten so used to letting Facebook and Twitter and Reddit and you name it, have all kinds of personal information on us, which they track all the time. And it can be turned over to federal authorities anytime under warrants for investigation of specific crimes. And the difficulty with the NSA operation in the terrorist period is they were issuing blanket warrants. We can't allow that. And this isn't just the same old, same old. This is growing. This is a growing threat to our democracy because of electronics because of the, the, our acceptance of a technology which allows the government and others to intrude into our lives and gather all kinds of information. I mean, I sign on websites today. You know, I use a thing called MailChimp to transmit some of my blogs from my website, reclaimingamericandream.org. And when I sign on that website, I have to click and say, I accept their cookies. Their cookies are their trackers. This is, this is the world we now live in. So I don't think any of this is old news. I think this is absolutely vibrant and fresh. And if some lessons from Vietnam and from this old reporter who's been bouncing around the world doing this job for the last five decades or more can help young people understand the threat to their future, then God bless it. Uh, we need to talk about it. what you're talking about is vitally important. And there should not be an ability of any executive leader. I don't care who the president is. I don't care whether I voted for him or against him or voted for her or against her. The Constitution deliberately does not give the executive the power to wage war. It requires Congress to do that. And Congress has abdicated uh, and, and abdicated its power. And we got to get that back, restored back so that so that our lives, our treasure, our national in involvement can't be engaged without the popular will being behind it. This isn't to say there isn't going to be some reason we want to go to war. But most of the wars that have been fought since Vietnam have not been fought with the public behind them or any kind of open direct vote. There was, there was, you know, in the initial involvement um, back in Afghanistan. But it's been reinterpreted and reinterpreted and sort of everybody's glided along ever since then. So now I don't think these are, this is not an old issue. These are simply issues that echo from one generation to the next. They carry on. And what they do, if they carry on, what they're telling you is they're really important. If they go away, they were just an issue of that time. But if you find an echo today, it's this is a critical issue. You've just touched a neuralgic point. You've just touched a nerve end in the way democracy functions or doesn't function or should function. And so I'm all with you on that. This is, this is current news. This just was a chapter that was written, a uh, preamble that was written 50 years ago, but it's current news right now. So good for you for going after it. Well, thank you for that, sir. And I, and I got to tell you, I couldn't agree more. You know, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, nothing's new under the sun. Well, if nothing's new under the sun, it's because, as you correctly know, these are contentious issues that any, you know, powerful and vibrant democracy has to deal with. And it, the issues that you brought up that are still with us, the role and scope of executive power, congressionally mandated and delegated war powers, and whether we're following that, as well as the free press. You know, just in closing, when I taught at West Point, one of the themes of our American history class, the freshman, was liberty versus order, the perennial American debate. We used to call it that, the, the an American debate. And, you know, we started talking about that from colonial era and, you know, the Adams administration and the Alien and Sedition Act, which don't look all that different from the Espionage Act and and so many of these things. But uh, that debate about liberty versus order and, and the role and scope of federal power and the, the the right of the free press and how it's tested, I think is just so important. And as you know, technology and the internet contributes to that debate, but doesn't define it. It still falls under a lot of the same major issues.
And uh, you live, I mean, that debate about liberty and order, it's, you know, I think one of the great things about having you on, and we're so thankful, is that you lived a lot of that debate, suffered it, tested it, and maybe contributed to that vital and contentious debate that you described that's ongoing. And certainly we haven't seen the last of this discussion. And I imagine, you know, uh, guys like Henry and I, our grandkids are probably still going to be grappling with a lot of these issues if our democracy stays, uh, stays healthy. So I couldn't thank there's you. Going to be a young, there's going to be young Danny hosting a, hosting a, a podcast like you 20 years from now. I'm going to say to you, oh, man, now tell me about when you went into Iraq in 2003. <laughs> and, it'll be, and then it'll really seem like ancient history. I, I, hope, I hope that maybe my, uh, my sons are a little less insufferable and exasperating than their father. <laughs> and therefore, maybe don't want to host the podcast. But, uh, sir, thank you so much again for coming on. Um, I hope we can continue the conversation. I'll look forward to being part of that and honored to be part of that same uh, panel at UMass uh, that's covering a lot of these same issues as well as so many other things. And for our listeners, we're going to post uh, a bunch of great links to uh, uh, videos of previous work and, and websites that kind of, you know, um, highlight some of the stuff that that, that Hedrick has done. And uh, just really, let's continue this debate. And thank you again so much, sir. My pleasure, Danny. Great show, Henry. Thanks for, uh, for all your good questions. Nice talking to you, Hedrick. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention, I will not